you do not have to have a birth plan that involves not getting an epidural, or you do not have to have a birth plan or birth preferences that are followed to a T in your labor. Things, situations might change, you might change your mind and that's okay. But what really for me made my birth experience so positive is that every single person in that room was on my team. Every single person in that room listened to me. beautiful birthing people. Welcome back to my channel. So today's video is one that I am so excited to film for you guys. So excited to get documented for myself too so that I can remember all of these things. And that is the birth of this little peanut right here. So six days ago I went into labor and I had a baby and I wasn't pregnant forever. Yay, because I really felt like I was gonna be pregnant forever. And for those of you who follow me on Instagram, shout out to my Instagram if you don't, it's Nurse Same. I'm posting over there a ton right now. Yeah, I was, I was losing it just a little bit. And uh, in my last video, I was losing it just a little bit. Video that came up right before this one about my freezer meals was actually filmed the day before I went into labor. If you want more about my headspace, kind of where I was right before I went into labor, then definitely check out that video. I'll leave it linked. It's my most recent video. But then, kind of let's skip ahead to actually like, I'm in labor. So the day that I filmed the food video, I was 40 and one weeks gestation. And I had had an OB appointment and I had had my membrane swept. I was kind of hoping, fingers crossed, that that was gonna stir things up. I woke up the next morning and I was still pregnant and I was like, oh, okay, I'm still pregnant. That's okay, let's just like live our lives, do our thing and hope for the best. So we went in the morning to the park and had a play date. And then when I got home, did some work on the computer. I edited a couple of videos. Point, as I'm editing videos, I'm starting to get some cramping. I'm starting to get some tightening of my uterus that I wouldn't call painful, but was noticeable. And I wasn't really timing them, but maybe like every like 10 to 15 minutes, I would notice some tightening. And I was like, well, Maybe this is early labor, but my body does this all the time, especially when I've been like out and about and exercising or moving my body like we did at the park that morning. And then nothing happens. And also because I had that membrane sweep, a lot of times that'll stir things up, but not enough to actually throw you into labor. It's enough to make you like uncomfortable and crampy. And then it's maybe like two, 2.30 and I was like, okay, let me go lay down for a nap. And I went and laid down for a nap and things definitely were starting to get a little bit more intense with the cramping. Like it was feeling more like a strong menstrual cramp. So I laid down with my heating pad on my back. I got comfortable in a couple different positions with the pillow. And I think I fell asleep for a little bit. I woke up not feeling like I slept, but in a pile of drool. So chances are I was asleep. And at that point I was like, hmm, I feel like things are maybe feeling like early labor, but I'm not really sure. So I was like, let me check and see if I can get to my cervix. Do not check your cervix unless you know what you're doing. You can't break your water, pro tip. But I checked my cervix and the day before I had been two centimeters and easy two is what my provider called me and it was a man who checked me. So he did have bigger fingers and 60% of face, so still, pretty thick and the baby was at a minus two station. So not quite engaged in the pelvis yet. When I checked my cervix, I called myself like a three, but there was still a lot of thickness and the baby was not well applied to the cervix. And a well applied baby to the cervix is what really is gonna get labor started. So I was like, well, my exam that I just did could be the exact same exam that he did because two to three, and he called me an easy two, I called me a three. Who's to say? So I was like, well, we'll see. I'm not really, I don't wanna mess with things. I don't wanna keep checking myself because I don't wanna make this prodromal not labor thing worse if that's what it is. So at that point, we were trying to make dinner and my husband had class that night and I was like, okay, we're gonna try and make dinner. I'm gonna put the kids down and then we he'll go to his class and then I'll go to the hospital. I've been texting one of my friends who's at work like, oh, who's on today? What are they doing? Like just giving her updates. And of course she's giving everybody updates at work. So they kind of like think like maybe Elizabeth is gonna be coming in. And at like between like five and 6 p.m. I went to the bathroom and I wiped and there was a good amount of mucus mixed with a little bit of blood. 
which is totally normal to have that little bit of like bloody show mixed in. And what that tells us often is that there is some cervical change happening. The cervix is super vascular. As it starts to open and thin, sometimes we see a little bit of blood mixed in with mucus. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm probably in labor. At this point, I'm contracting probably about every five minutes and I am having to breathe through them. I can still talk through them, but I definitely need to move through them. So I'm on the birthing ball bouncing or I'm on hands and knees kind of rocking back and forth. That is tends to be my go-to in labor. It feels really good to have that rhythm. At this point, it's like just about seven. We're working on getting the kids down. So we call my brother who lives in our neighborhood to come on over to our house to kind of hang out with our kids and finish putting them down. And then we work on getting things together here. So I already have both my bags packed. High five. Got videos on that if you want to know my labor and my postpartum bag. We leave to go to the hospital and I'm contracting every like two to three minutes and they're feeling pretty intense. But as we're exiting our neighborhood, I get a contraction in the car and I kid you not, I was like, it was horrible. Just sitting in the car was horrible with that contraction. So I made my husband pull over so that I could get out of the car and move my body through the contraction. We pulled over a lot. One point two, we pulled over into this neighborhood and I get out of this car and there's a man getting his mail and I must have scared the bejesus out of him because I am, when I get out of the car, bracing myself on the car. I'm rocking like side to side, braced on the car, moaning. And he hightailed it on out of there. He was like, I am not about to birth this baby. I scared that man. It was, it was actually pretty hilarious. We get there and we park the car. I have a contraction in the parking garage. And I was like, okay, I do not want to have another contraction until I get into labor and delivery. So I was, I wouldn't say running. I would say speed walking very, very, very quickly. And I get to the front desk and I was like, I'm going to have a baby. And they're like, Elizabeth, and my last name. And I was like, yes, 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 that's me. My birth photographer's coming. And then I just run and I get to the front desk and I hand them my insurance and my ID card. And I, they open the door. They're like, what room do you want? And I was like, I don't care. I don't care. And they're like, okay, but you pick a room. And I was like, what's, what's available? Okay. Room nine, because that was the closest one to the hallway. And I just booked it to that room. And I got in there and I got in the room. My husband's still registering me and I turn off the lights and I turn on the tub because I was like, I want to get in the tub. So we get in there and my nurse who is amazing and I'm so glad that she got to take care of me, she comes in and we go over a little bit of history and she gets me on the monitor, baby's looking great. I am on hands and knees at this point rocking, but on the monitor, we're getting vital signs, we're doing everything. So even if you need to be on the monitor, you don't have to be on your back, you don't have to be in the bed. Those are really uncomfortable positions to be in when you're in labor. So I was on hands and knees, moving and grooving and doing my thing. The doctor comes in and it is a doctor who is really new to the practice where I go. So I have worked with her once in the hospital and I've seen her once in the office. And honestly, I was, before I went into labor, like I was like, I don't really want her to be my doctor because I don't know her. And I like that I know my doctors, right? Cause I work with them. I'm so glad that she was my doctor. I'm gonna tell you all the amazing things that she did. She was such an advocate for me and such a true listener. And here's something I wanna to say too. You do not have to have a birth plan that involves not getting an epidural, or you do not have to have a birth plan or birth preferences that are followed to a T in your labor. Things, situations might change, you might change your mind and that's okay. But what really for me made my birth experience so positive is that every single person in that room was on my team. Every single person in that room listened to me and to what I wanted and cared about me and what I wanted and did their best to help make what I wanted a reality. And I know that if something had gone wrong or if things had changed and, and my birth plans and birth preferences weren't followed exactly, I still would feel really, really positive about my birth because of those, those things. So this provider, the doctor who was taking care of me was amazing. I'm so glad she was my provider. I almost think it was better that I didn't know her super well because I could just do what I was doing and not worry about what she was thinking about me and know that she was on my team based on how she was acting. So she comes in and asks if I would like my cervix checked. And I was like, yes, please check my cervix. And she checked my cervix and I was four, 80 and minus one. So my cervix had thinned out quite a bit and baby had come down 
into the mid pelvis range, but I was only four centimeters. And I was like, I am hurting really bad and I'm contracting every two minutes at this point. And so I really thought I was gonna be more dilated. So I was a little bit disappointed, but I was like, well, we have lots of options. And the first option is that I wanna get in the tub. So let's go do that and we'll go from there. You have the option to labor in water. I love it, I think it's fabulous. Try it, see if you like it. And I go and get in the jacuzzi tub and I'm also group B strep positive. So they give me at this point my first dose of antibiotics. It's about 8.15. So I got there at about eight, get in the tub at 8.15 with my first dose of antibiotics. And in the tub, I'm really using the jets and the warm water. I'm making sure that I'm letting out water and adding more warm water as we go because the jets really make the water get cold pretty quickly. And I'm doing a lot of the same positions. So like leaning over the tub and rocking back and forth through the contractions, really moaning through the contractions. Um, I'll try and do an example. Oh, oh. At, at one point I was kind of sitting crisscross applesauce and like bouncing through the contractions too and um, a few different things that I was saying to myself in my head at this point but then also out loud is like they're coming down it's coming down it's coming down you would say to yourself like don't make the decision to get an epidural during a contraction so I said that to myself a lot and then I also said to myself a lot I can do anything for 60 seconds those were the two things and I didn't say them out loud but I said them in my head that were really really helpful to me the other thing that was really helpful that I love, this is one of my favorite tricks, the comb trick, okay? This guy, you put th this side to your hand and when a contraction starts, you just squeeze. You squeeze really, really hard. It's the gate control theory of pain. And basically this sensation gets to your brain a little bit faster than the contraction feeling. And it really, really helped me. This is like one of my number one, if you wanna go unmedicated, one of my number one labor tips is this comb. I'm squeezing my comb, I'm breathing, I'm moving through the contractions, and things are feeling more intense, and my doctor comes in, and she kneels down next to the side of the tub, and she says, hey, what can I do for you right now? Is there anything I can do for you? And I said, you know, I think I would like to get my cervix checked. Things are feeling different, and I'd like to know where I am. I think that would help me in making any decisions any decisions that might be need to be made because I was starting to feel really, really intense at this point. And that was at about 9 p.m. So I hopped out of that tub, got in the bed, she checked me and I was six centimeters. And I was like, okay, if I'm six, this is active labor, like I can do this until transition. So I go and I hop back in the tub and things are definitely getting a lot more intense. And my birth song at this point is changing from some low moaning into a maybe a little bit more of some curse words. The F word was my go-to, but it was, I'm gonna use truck because we're gonna keep this a little bit family friendly, but I was still using it in a way that had rhythm and that had ritual to it. So, I almost said the F word. Truck, 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 truck and then doing some nice moans after I got through the peak of that contraction. Things are definitely escalating. I'm still contracting every two minutes. I'm feeling really, really intense. So at this point, I've also had my husband start to do a little bit of counter pressure on my back, and I used those yoga balls for him to do counter pressure. We had a big basin of cold ice water that we were putting washcloths in for my the back of my neck or for my face, and he put the balls in that, and then they were really, really cold when they went to my back. So that was feeling really, really good. So at about 9.45, as things are getting more intense, and the only reason why I know what time it was was because my nurse had on her Apple Watch, and I could see that occasionally. I was like, okay, I think I'd like to be checked again. I'm feeling maybe like a little bit more pushy. I just wanna know what's happening. You don't need to be checked as much as I was in labor, but my water was not broken and I just needed to know what was up. I was feeling really, really, really uncomfortable. And I was still kind of like, do I wanna keep doing this? Do I want an epidural? Would I like to ask for fentanyl or nitrous? So that's what I was trying to figure out. So I get back out of the water and I'm having, I try to pee and I can't pee. 
and I'm having intense contractions that are super, super painful. And the charge nurse is in there as well as my nurse doing hip squeezes and counter pressure. The doctor comes in, she starts doing some counter pressure too. She was very, very good at counter pressure. I get back in the bed and I am seven centimeters now and the baby is at zero station. So really get nice and low with a big bag of water. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I'm kind of like lying in the bed over to one side. And I was like, this is feeling really, really intense. Would you break my water? I'm feeling like that's what I would like you to do. But I am group B strep positive and I've only gotten one dose of antibiotics. And ideally our goal is two doses. But at this point, you know, it's only been about an hour and a half since my first dose and the doses for the ampicillin, which is what I was getting, were gonna be four hours apart. And the doctor was like, you're not gonna be pregnant enough, long enough to get the second dose. Like you're moving very quickly. So if you would like me to break your water, I would. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not sure what I would like to do. Like I'm kind of talking about it through the contractions. Like I was like, breaking my water is gonna make things more intense but I also just want to get this over with and have a baby. And the doctor's kind of standing there with the things to break my water. And she's like, well, I don't want to stand here and like watch you, you know, would you like me to come back? What would you like me to do? And I was like, no, just stand there. Cause I think I want you to do it after this next contraction. And she was like, okay, well, once I break your water, why don't we go ahead and you get back on your hands and knees? Cause you seem to really, really like that and see how that feels. So she breaks my water nice and clear and I flip back over onto hands and knees and I'm getting counter pressure and a hip squeeze and my nurse goes to listen to the baby because that's what they want to do after your water's broken to just make sure with the change in environment the baby's still tolerating everything really well and she goes to do that and it's uncomfortable and I was like don't touch me and literally every single person in that room who had their hands on me stopped touching me that's amazing that's how it always should be when, when the patient says, stop touching me. And I was like, oh no, keep doing the back stuff. So then after that contraction passed, my nurse did listen to the baby and was able to listen through the next contraction. It just like really kind of threw me off and, and, and baby sounded great. So that was fabulous. And at this point, when they had broken my water, it was like 10 PM and the baby's starting to come down and I'm feeling it and I'm feeling a lot and I'm like starting to feel kind of pushy. So. The doctor was like, is it okay if I check you? Or maybe I even asked, I was like, can you see if it's time? And she said, you still have some cervix, you're about nine centimeters. So why don't you sit up a little bit taller and put yourself up over the head of the bed. So they brought the head of the bed up and I put myself over the head of the bed, still got my comb. And then there's like the actual part of the bed in front. I was like holding on to that as well. I'm doing my um, F word mantra. <laughs> getting through these contractions they're doing the double hip squeeze and the pressure and I can um and I have my knees kind of together my feet apart I can feel her coming down and I can I'm starting to push and I can feel that I'm pooping and I will tell you my nurse and my doctor were the poop dream team right because if you're on hands and knees your anus is above where the baby's going to come out so theoretically you can like poop on their face if you poop on their face Spoiler alert, it's fine. There's a reason why babies come out of that area and it's to get colonized with bacteria because their guts are sterile when they're first born. But, but, but I prefer not to poop on my baby's face if we can avoid it. So my husband was like, they were just running back and forth to the bathroom, putting it in the red bin. And I pooped a lot. And you know what? That's fine. I can look every single one of those people in the eye because I would do the same for every single one of them. But um, so I'm pushing a little bit and pooping and I, it's, Feeling your baby come down is the weirdest sensation because it's so much pressure and you can feel her coming down and coming down. And I start to feel like her head is coming and I'm like, she's coming, they get everything ready. I'm still on my hands and knees kind of draped over the front of the bed and pushing and her head comes out and I did not listen to my own advice when I felt the burn to slow down my pushing. I think you really need somebody in the room to say that to you, especially if you don't have an epidural. Some people are super controlled. I am not one of them. So I pushed her head out and then I just felt like she needed a little bit more room for her shoulders. So I brought my um, right leg up and planted my foot on the bed, almost in like a uh, Captain Morgan type position and the rest of the baby was born. Now what I didn't know is baby was born with her hand up by her face. I think it was her left hand based on where my tearing was, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, 
but she comes out. I didn't catch her. I was not in the headspace to do so, and that's totally fine. But she comes out, and the doctor has her, and the doctor then hands her to me in between my legs. I still don't know what the gender is. Nobody said anything. And I, what I'm feeling is I feel a baby in between my legs, and I feel what I thought was a penis, but I guess it was the umbilical cord. And, and everybody's like, what is it, Elizabeth? What, what, did, what did you have? And I'm just like, uh, I think it's a boy. It feels like a boy, but my eyes are still closed. And they're like, well, why don't you look and, and see? Because they all knew that it was a girl because that's what they saw when she came out. I like, look down and I'm like, oh, it's a girl. And I just like burst into tears that like I did it and it's over and it's a girl. And I really thought that, that she was going to be a boy. And that's what everybody thought, including the Spanish speaking grandmother who told me Nino, but she was wrong. And I just was like in shock. And this is the picture of that and when I look at this picture and I look at my husband doing this and everybody else in the room and, and like my face it's just like so beautiful and so powerful and just this amazing moment and one of the reasons why I'm so glad that we hired a birth photographer and Maggie Williams was our birth photographer. I'm gonna leave her Instagram and everything linked down below. She's so amazing. Go look at her other work. Go follow her. I love her. I love her. I love her such a calming presence in my birth space too. She's also a doula. We didn't have her as a doula for this experience just as a birth photographer, but her presence was so calming and so amazing. We did do our delayed cord clamping for five minutes, which was my request. I flip over in the bed so that she can look at my perineum, see if I have any tearing. Unfortunately, I do. I have a second degree tear. So between the bottom of my vagina and my anus, it tore through the skin and a little bit through the muscle. And I also had a left labial tear, which is why I think she came out with her left hand by her face. That is typically clinically what we see. Whichever side the hand is, there's a little bit of extra tearing. And it, there's often some tearing when we have a compound presentation, which is what we call when we have a hand up by the face. At that point, she puts some lidocaine in. It's a medication that helps numb everything up. It feels a little bit burny. And I'm like shaking a lot because that's what happens after you have a baby your adrenaline is like on overdrive so they get me some warm blankets she offers if I wanted anything additionally for pain like through my IV for the repair to let her know but I was like you know no I just I don't want that the effects of that to kind of be something that take over so I'm totally fine do your thing so she numbs me up very very nicely she does the repair totally fine at that point we're just kind of waiting on my placenta and we're waiting and we're waiting and I was still feeling a lot of like afterbirth cramping from my body working on getting the placenta out. And she was like, the placenta is like right here in your vagina. And I was like, I like tried and I couldn't really push it out. I just like couldn't get my head around it. So she was like, if it's okay with you, can I reach in and I'll get it? It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be really uncomfortable for a second. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll just do that. It was really uncomfortable, it was horrible. And when she was doing that, I kind of like kicked my leg out and got a Charlie horse because I hadn't taken my magnesium that day. <laughs> and so like I had a Charlie horse and like, you know, somebody pulled my placenta out and that was uncomfortable. And then because the placenta had been sitting there for so long, there were some clots that came out behind it. And so then she gave, gave my belly a little like massage afterwards. These are the parts that I feel like you're not maybe necessarily prepared for after an unmedicated delivery are like the fundal massage, which is when they press on the top of your uterus and like giving birth to the placenta, just because like, you're like, I did it, the baby's here, everything's good. And everything was good, but there were still some uncomfortable parts that needed to happen to make sure that I was safe as far as what my bleeding was looking like. She got a few more clots out, but then my bleeding was good. My uterus was nice and firm and clamped down to prevent any additional excessive bleeding. And we kind of got the bed back together. And then I just got to do some skin to skin for like a whole hour. And she got to stay with me. And yeah, it was amazing. And it was a really, really beautiful birth experience. And I felt really supported by everybody in the room. My husband did a great job. He was there. He was attentive at the bedside. My nurse was amazing. The charge nurse who was there, who was great. The doctor was great. I just felt really listened to and heard. So this little peanut, a baby girl, seven pounds, 10 ounces, smallest baby I've had, even though I was pregnant for the longest. The didn't know what her name was going to be. Oh, I was scrolling through. I was looking up hipster baby names because we have May and Holden and those are both pretty hipster. And I stumbled across Rosalie and I was like, oh, I like that. Could be Rose, could be Rosie. That's super pretty. I brought it up to my husband. He was like, I don't hate it. I was like, I like that you don't hate it. Got it and it really grew on both of it. It grew on him especially. And so she became little Miss Rosalie. So 
We call her Rosie, some we call her Rosalie, but let me show you her sweet little face. Say, I just have a little bit of newborn rash still. She was really rashy first few days in the hospital. Because I only got the one dose of the antibiotics, they had me stay for close to 48 hours so that they could monitor her for a groupie strep infection. But I really wasn't ruptured very long and their evidence shows that you do have some protection after at least one dose as long as it's been in for an hour. So she did great. We didn't have any groupie strep infection. Bless, bless, bless. Postpartum went well, pain was well controlled. I definitely had some pain in my hips and my back. I was like, oh, it was from all the counter pressure. So my heating pad was a godsend as well as for the afterbirth cramps that were pretty intense with breastfeeding. But I was able to get up and go to the bathroom and pee like a couple hours after her delivery, walk to my postpartum room. These are the reasons why I really love having a birth without an epidural because of that ability to move afterwards. And yeah. She was here and it was an amazing birth and such a great experience and such a great like end of a novel of me giving birth in our birth history because we are not gonna be having any more children. Three is a good number for us. So we're really happy. We're so in love. My kiddos are adjusting fairly well. My son is a little tantrumy and, and my daughter because everybody just needs more attention than they're getting, but we are doing our best. And we've got a lot of family here helping us and uh, yeah. That was it. Uh, I hope that that birth story was helpful for you guys. Maybe you learned some tips on things that you can do in your birth to help you work through things. I hope that you have the beautiful birth that you're hoping for and I hope that you also have the providers who listen to you and respect you and your wishes. And until next time, bye guys.